Today, we're going to discuss Mission Bio's new capability to look at SMVs and CMVs from the same single cells on the Tapestry platform. We're really excited about this new capability, and we thank everyone for attending our webinar. Today's agenda, I will give a brief overview um, of our new SMV plus CMV capability. Uh, we'll give an overview of why SMVs and CMVs are important to study, uh, particularly together. Uh, we'll talk about how we do the CMV analysis using the Tapestry platform. And then finally, my colleague Robert will go into more detail of how to execute uh, the, data the data analysis using real samples, samples from tumors and cell lines. All right, so let's get started. Why do we want to study both SMVs and CMVs? Well, somatic nucleotide variants, or SMVs, and copy number variations, or CMVs, occur in the majority of, can of cancers, with CMVs often preceding SMVs. There are about, it is estimated that there are about 3.5 million common SNPs in any one person, uh, with about 30 new SMVs arising de novo. Uh, while for CMVs, it is estimated that it affects roughly 12% of the uh, human genome. And so we know both of these variations, both SMVs and CMVs, are important for diseases such as cancer, and so we want to have the ability to study both. When you couple the ability to measure both SMVs and CMVs at a single cell level, you get more information about the clonality of your cells, uh, which in turn means that you get more biological insights into your sample, which ultimately can improve clinical diagnostics and patient care. In a recent paper in Cell by Nick Novin's group, they are the leaders um, in looking at SMVs and CMVs on a single cell level. And to quote them, they say, this analysis identified two to five major subpopulations in each patient, which was higher than the number of subpopulations detected by single cell copy number profiling alone. Thus also giving credence to this notion that we want to be able to study both SMVs and CMVs at the single cell level in order to get a complete picture of what's happening in, um, in a disease. So we're proud to introduce our platform, the Tapestry platform, that can, is the only platform that can look at SMVs and CMVs together. Excuse me. What this means is that there's one comprehensive platform that can do both. The resolution for CMVs is on a gene or chromosomal, chromosomal level, and it can detect both amplifications, deletions, and loss of heterozygosity. And we'll talk a lot more about this um, later in the talk. The way the platform works is that we use targeted panels. And so that means that you can look specifically at the SMVs and CMVs that are of interest to you. And then again, because we're combining both SMVs and CMVs in one workflow, that means that from the same sample, you get information on both of these aspects, and you're getting it for the same cost, which leads to both sample and cost efficiency uh, using a single workflow. So for those that are not familiar with the Tapestry platform, uh, it's very simple. We basically take single cells, we put them on our microfluidic device on the Tapestry platform, which encapsulates the single cells and barcodes them. We then make a NGS library and put that on a Lumina sequencer. And then we visualize the results of the SMVs and CMVs using uh, our software and data analysis package. If we look more closely of what's happening on the Tapestry platform, Again, we're taking our single cells and through the microfluidic chip, we're encapsulating them into oil droplets. We then, this is the power of the tapestry platform, um, is that we then 
use a protease in order to isolate the DNA. We then take the, D, uh, the DNA or the cell lysate and put it back in the microfluidic chip. And this is where we add reagents that both barcode the cells uh, as well as introduce the targeted panel, either catalog or custom, in order to amplify different regions of interest. We then, after amplification, make an NGS library and go on to data analysis. So a little bit more in depth about how specifically the CMV approach work, works. For our tapestry platform, we're using a targeted approach, which means that we get information on the gene and chromosomal level. And this is in just juxtaposition to a single cell whole genome amplification approach, which is using lower coverage in order to look across the entire genome as opposed to specific genes or chromosomes. And so there are benefits to both methods. The benefits of using a targeted approach is that one, we have very high resolution on SMVs and CNVs because we have a 40 to 80X coverage at these regions. And so the targeted approach allows us to really get fine, um, greater resolution on the SNP that is present at the site, as well as we're using the read information to get uh, to measure copy number variation. The other major, so the other major advantage is it, um, it results in 60 times less sequencing costs using this targeted approach versus whole genome. And so the resolution is on the level of 20 KB versus a, tw a two megabase resolution. So I wanted to talk a little bit of how our method works. We're basically using two methods to look at CMVs. And again, because we're getting information from SMVs and CMVs, we can actually leverage the information from the SMVs to measure copy number variation. So how this works in the schematic on the left is that if you have a heterozygous um, call, if you have a copy number loss, so a loss of heterozygosity, that heterozygous call goes to either a reference or a homozygous call. And so again, we're using this genotype information and we're leveraging it to assess copy number variation. And we're saying that when you go from a het to a reference or a het to a home, Across many, very, uh, across many variants across the chromosomal location, this is indicative of a loss of heterozygosity. And so in our, our package analysis, we produce, uh, we produce a graph on genotype in which we're able to see these changes. So on the graph to the right, uh, we have reference in gray, we have heterozygous in red, and we have hom homozygous in maroon. And so on the x-axis are all the variants. Remember, we're using a targeted approach. So we have all of the targets of our genes across these chromosomes. And then on the y-axis, we have all of our single cells. Uh, we have our normal cells on the top and our tumor cells on the bottom. And so what we're looking for is this red to gray or red to maroon transition in which we can identify across large um, across large spans of chromosomes, as well as in, in as well as in specific genes, this transition from het to reference or home, in order to interrogate loss of heterozygosity. In our second method, we utilize the read count information that we're getting in order to also calculate CMVs. And again, because we're doing this targeted approach at ADX coverage, we have really high resolution um, of the reads and potential copy number changes at each location. And so what we do is we take the populations that were defi defined using our SMV analysis, and we define what our control group is. 
And then we do a normalization at each amplicon and calculate ploidy um, of each cell against the control group. We then visualize these on a heat map and a line graph. And so we're, what we're seeing on the right in the upper uh, panel is a heat map of the ploidy that was calculated for each cell. And again, using the same sample, we can see in red that we see these regions going across many different variants across large chromosomal regions where, can, we, where we can actually see loss of heterozygosity in different locations in different chromosomes. We can then quantify this uh, into actual ploidy values or copy number values and create a line graph per gene to look at what the copy number is at each location. So now we wanna illustrate the new capability of SMV and CMV using uh, real samples. So primary tumor samples in this case. We were very fortunate to collaborate with Charlie Swanton's lab. And the beauty about this collaboration was that they published a paper in Cell in 2018. And so they had lots of bulk sequencing data in which we uh, leveraged in our own single cell experiments. So what they did in this paper were, was they were interested in the heterogeneity across a tumor sample. They took a tumor sample from renal cell carcinoma and they had five different slices. And then within each of these slices, they sampled at many different places and they did bulk sequencing to assess if what the variation was at different locations within the tumor. And so illustrated on the right, what they saw was that they had, they found single nucleotide variants, they saw loss of heterozygosity, they saw, uh, they saw CMV gains, and then they saw indels we were able to take these same samples and run them on the tapestry platform in order to look at both SMVs and CMVs. And again, the strength of this study was that we already knew from bulk sequencing what each sample uh, contained. Here's a little bit of background about our tapestry single cell experiment. So again, we took renal cell carcinoma tumors and we isolated nuclei from them using our nuclei extraction protocol, uh, which works great. So on the tapestry platform, you can either st start with single cells or single isolated nuclei. In this case, we started with single isolated nuclei. And then they used a custom panel of 338 amplicons. Because they knew that they had CMVs and they were interested in looking at the CMVs, they designed their panel specifically to cover the areas where they knew that there would be copy number losses. Um, so you can see this uh, reflected in the number of amplicons that they're covering in each chromosome. They also know in renal cell carcinoma, chromosome 3, 9, and 14 a loss of those chromosomes has been implicated in renal cell carcinoma. And so they really covered those, uh, those chromosomes well. And then on the right are just some basic metrics that we get from a tapestry single cell experiment. Uh, we had an average of around 4,500 uh, 4, nuclei with a panel uniformity of 87% and a coverage of around 50X. So next, my colleague Robert will go into more specific detail of how to do the data analysis for SMVs and CMVs. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Kelly. So, all right, next we analyze the data using uh, our uh, new CMV R package to detect SMVs and indels, as well as uh, measure single cell copy number profiles. Um, so, what does the analysis tool to um, do, and, and how does it really work? So, on a high level. Um, there are two steps, as Kelly already pointed out earlier. Um, uh, they are involved in um, number one. It allows you uh, step number one allows you to infer LH using the genotype data, uh, whereas the step two really measures ploidy using genotype and read count data. 
The tool requires two main inputs by us, and both are generated by the tapestry pipeline. Uh, number one is the genotype data, and number two is your sequencing read data. The genotype data, um, typically the Loom file, um, lists all detected SNVs and indels uh, that are detected across all identified cells. Um, the sequencing read data, on the other hand, lists all raw sequencing reads across all amplicons in your panel for each individual cell. So beginning with the first step, by using the genotype data, we apply a set of quality filters to only include high quality informative SNVs and indels. And then secondly, we use that filtered information to cluster across all cells and visualize the data in heat map format. Um, so finally, then we interpret um, the genotype distribution across different cell populations. That, that allows us to, number one, gain insights into LOH patterns. Number two, to differentiate um, normal, a, a normal diploid cell population from a potentially malignant tumor cell population. And then thirdly, to associate molecular SNV data with the, the structural CNV information. The second step integrates single cell genotype data with single cell read count data. And so instead of relying on raw read count information, which in single cell really can be noisy and variable at, at, at times, we take advantage of the high quality genotype information to help calculate ploidy values and construct consensus single cell copy number profiles. So let's take a look at um, step number one. Um, so we are using the same data that um, the RCC that Kelly introduced um, just um, previously. Genotype filtering is performed based on a number of different quality metrics, including, but also not restricted to the genotype quality, read depth information, as well as single cell mutant allele frequencies. The result is, um, in this case, a number of variants, um, a little over 230 shown on the x-axis at the heat map, um, that represent synonymous mutations, such as germline variants, as well as non-synonymous mutations, um, such as pathogenic and disease-driving variants. Uh, we then hierarchical cluster um, we then hierarchical cluster of the data across all cells and order the variants according to chromosome coordinate. Uh, here in this case, ranging from chromosome one through chromosome X. So all six chromosomes really are covered by the, by the RCC custom gene panel. Um, the result is then visually shown um, at the bottom um, here as a heat map where uh, rows uh, refer to cells and columns refer to uh, variants. The three color uh, code, again, uh, just as a reminder, Kelly just introduced that indicates the different zygosity states um, as calculated by the genotype color. So gray displays reference only alleles, the light red indicates heterozygosity, and the dark red marks homozygous mutant only alleles. And what becomes apparent um, at first is number one, the ability to clearly differentiate two main populations, a minor population on top that uh, predominantly is characterized by reference only and heterozygous genotypes, and a major population at the bottom with, with increased presence of homozygous mutant genotypes. Now, qualitatively comparing the genotype distribution patterns across both cohorts of cells um, allows us to classify the top population as normal or as the reference diploid cell group, whereas the bottom population is associated to loss of heterozygosity or LOH. In particular variants that are residing on chromosomes three, nine, and 14 uh, display discordant genotypes between both groups of cells, in which heterozygously called variants in the control group become either reference only, shown in gray, or homozygous mutant only, shown in dark red. So really, in, in other words, uh, multiple LOH events across multiple chromosomal regions can be observed um, that co-occur in a defined subset of cells um, consistent with the model that Kelly just outlined earlier. Chromosomes 1, 10, and X um, are not implicated um, by LOH. So next, we then um, can also associate LOH with um, SNV uh, by reviewing the zygosity distribution of known pathogenic variants. And so that's what we did um, here in, in this, in this um, zoom-in. In this particular sample, we were successful in identifying two disease-relevant variants, one um, SNV and the VHL locus on the, on the left, and one indel in the BAP1 locus on the right. 
And so the takeaway from this slide is number one, um, both mutations co-occur in the same set of cells. Um, that's one of the metrics that Singer cell gives you. But more importantly, um, secondly, the mutant cells can be unambiguously associated to the LOH group that was previously identified with the help of all gen genotype information. All right, and then finally, we also continue and demonstrate the ability to distinguish um, diploid from non-diploid cells and to the identification of LOH in defined subset of cells with an independent second data set. So the results are um, shown here of the analysis, again, in heat map format um, at the bottom of, of the slide. Um, in summary, um, on the right-hand side, in total, um, we identified 12 LOH events or SNVs or indels um, that were successfully identified across both patients. And those findings were orthogonally validated um, using bulk sequencing um, as reported in the original cell publication. So using high quality single cell genotype data uh, to detect LOH is a feasible approach. Um, so how about um, the ability to measure ploidy or copy number amplification events uh, using single cell amplicon data? So going back to the schematic overview, um, we now follow step uh, number two. Really um, as an introduction in short, uh, we are leveraging the high coverage genotype data to help define the diploid cell population that then really serves as our internal reference cohort of cells to accurately calculate ploidy values. Um, we then subsequently cluster C and B data and ultimately visualize the results in heat map and line, for, line graph format. So a little bit more in detail what, what this algorithm does. Um, we first, again, define a diploid reference cell population using all information we can gather from SNVs and indels um, that, we, that was previously clustered across all cells. And that is typically um, a more exploratory approach uh, right now that uses uh, domain expertise to really help define the number of clusters um, that are present, as well as identify the group of cells that represents the diploid reference cohort. Um, in this particular case um, of the renal cell carcinoma data, the reference cell population was clearly identified using uh, both genotype information from synonymous germline mutations, as well as non-synonymous uh, pathogenic variants as you um, can appreciate. So secondly, the ploidy values um, are then being calculated by essentially normalizing each amplicon and scale it uh, to its median value. The calculations are based on pre-classified normal diploid population that was identified using high quality, high def genotype data, as opposed to the typically used normalized read counts um, that is prone to, uh, uh, to be a little bit more noisy. So really that's the takeaway that we are defining um, our reference population that will serve as our template for subsequent CNB uh, calculations um, with high coverage 40X to 60X um, um, genotype information as opposed to sparse um, read count information. And then finally, CNB or ploidy values are used um, to cluster across all cells to detect the copy number loss or gains um, after um, heat map uh, visualization. So here in this particular case, sorry. So here in this particular case, um, the results indicate uh, the loss of a copy and genes residing on chromosome three, nine and 14. So really corroborating just the, the LOH data that we previously had shown. Um, there are no amplification events in this particular um, data set. Um, the qualitative, Sorry, in this case, so the qualitative assessment of the ploidy patterns on the left-hand side across all cells really lets you appreciate the differences in chromosome three, nine, and 14 compared to the normal cohort of cells on the top. Um, the quantitative assessment shown on the right-hand side uh, really powerfully outlines the changes in copy number as a function of genes across all amplicons um, that were covered um, by those chromosomes. So in addition to using primary tumor samples um, and a custom gene panel, we also successfully applied our methodology to cell line mixes um, using ready to order catalog panels. And so I wanna spend a few um, slides just um, demonstrating uh, data sets based on that data. So here, um, four different cancer cell lines, um, Jerkert, Raji, K562, as well as MUTS8, were mixed together in different relative fractions and were processed on the TAPS2 platform. 
Fast QFILES were then processed with our standard tapestry pipeline, and the data was analyzed using the CNBR package. Now, following the two-step model, the data was first clustered using single cell genotype data. Next, using that cluster data, um, that allowed us to identify the diploid reference population, in this case, the jerkrat cell line, and we calculated consensus copy number profiles for each cell, which we clustered again across all cells and visualized in a heat map shown on this slide. As a reminder, cells are clustered across rows and pre-selected variants in this case are ordered in columns from left to right. The red color or the red to blue color gradient outlines the different probability values, highlighting either copy number gain or copy number loss. Now, four hierarchy clusters are detectable in this particular data set, uh, corresponding to the four different cell lines that were mixed together. Um, of note is the Raji cells, uh, shown in yellow, uh, can be distinguished from the diploid jerkard cell line by only one single copy number amplification event in the KRAS locus. The other two samples, K562 as well as MUTS8, uh, display a more complex pattern of cop copy number loss uh, and gain across all filtered variants. The line plots shown in the middle of the slides provide a more quantitative readout of the structural variation across all cells. And um, notably, what I, point, what I want to point out is that all observed as in, uh, CNVs in each of the cell lines uh, really, really correlate well with published database information, um, such as COSMIC, um, with an R-square value of uh, more than 0 0.2, uh, sorry, 0 0.92. And then lastly, um, we investigated how sensitive our method is to calculate and utilize CNV information to detect rare populations of cells. So in this set of experiments, we used another ready-to-order catalog panel, uh, myeloid, and processed two cell line mixes with K562 cells spiked into the Raji cell um, line background with three different percentages. On the left-hand side, 50-50 mix, in the middle, a 10% spike in, and on the right-hand side, a 5% spike in. Again, the data was processed um, using the standard tapestry pipeline and then um, analyzed using the package. And then as you can appreciate um, from the heat map representation for all three experiments, the distinctively different copy number profiles across both cell lines really allowed us to successfully recover K562 cell lines down to 5% population frequency. At the bottom, uh, you can sort of appreciate what's coming next not yet included in the package, um, but will be soon. Um, when we finally project the data in lower dimensional TSNI space, um, using the single cell ploidy information, we were also successful in identifying both groups of cells um, as highlighted by the red and blue color code. In this case, it utilizes the genotype information to identify um, the cells as either Raji or K562. Um, so in summary, um, to uh, summarize this package, number one, it's a, it's a two-step model um, that uh, uses uh, single cell genotype data to detect LH. Um, and the second step that we define in this R script um, derives consensus single cell copy number profiles that leverages both single cell genotype data as well as single cell read count data. Um, the power of this is now that you have both information available that enables you to integrate both molecular SNV or indel information with structural CNV data to uh, gain more insights into cancer heterogeneity, which ultimately will have an impact in the clinic. Thank you, Robert, for going into detail on how we uh, leverage both the SMV and CMV data um, in order to quantify both at the single cell level. So we're very excited here at Mission Bio to introduce this new capability. I'm sure a lot of you are asking, all right, so how do I get started uh, to look at SMVs and CMVs in the same cell? Uh, what we offer the first step is to uh, use a targeted panel and so we offer catalog panels and custom panels. With our catalog panels, uh, we have AML, myeloid, CLL, and tumor hotspot. And the numbers indicate, so we recommend having at least three amplicons per gene. 
And so these panels um, are designed to cover at least 50% of genes to be able to look at CMV. Alternatively, you can design your own custom uh, panel using our Tapestry Designer platform if you go to www.tapestrydesigner.com. And what this allows you to do is enter a gene or region of interest. Uh, again, we recommend having at least three amplicons per gene. And you can custom design a panel to target the SMVs or CMVs that you are interested in. So in summary, uh, we are the first and only platform to co-detect CMVs and SMVs simultaneously in single cells. And this I'm really happy to emphasize. Uh, we're the leader in detecting SMVs on a single cell level using high quality DNA that is isolated in our droplets. Um, but not only can we do SMVs, we've now unlocked the capability to do CMVs. And so really it's the only platform that gets you both uh, levels of information. The really nice thing about the new CMV capability is that there's no change to the existing tapestry workflow um, or the single cell DNA panels. So you get double the information using the same trusted tapestry platform that you're used to using. Because there has been no change in the workflow and we've just added on this capability using bioinformatics, you can actually go back to previous data sets generated on the tapestry platform and reanalyze those data to look now for CMV changes. And because we're using a targeted approach, again, we have very high resolution of gene level and chromosomal level CMV changes at a fraction of the cost of doing a whole, uh, whole genome amplification approach. So where do you go to learn more? Well, we have an application note in which we have highlighted in this presentation uh, different figures from it. Uh, we have demo data sets available on our portal.missionbio slash data sets uh, website. Uh, so you can actually take the, uh, the AML four cell line mix or the myeloid spike in mix and recapitulate the data from, um, from what you've seen today. In order to order catalog or custom panels, please visit our website. And then the CMVR package and documentation for all attendees, we will send a follow-up email in the next few weeks, uh, providing a link to that package. For any other questions, please feel free to email us at info at missionbio.com. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and time, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you may have on the new SMV plus CMV capability. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Robert. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions that have come in from the Q&A, but I'd also like to just remind everybody if you have not answered the polling questions that are at the bottom, if you uh, press on the poll button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, we'd appreciate you uh, answering the, the poll there as well. Okay, we'll go to um, the, the Q&A here. And again, if you have any additional uh, questions to ask, please just go ahead and type that uh, by pressing on the Q&A button and entering your question there. So um, a couple of questions here around um, how to define uh, normal cells uh, as part of your normal sample. So I think these are two questions that are tied together. Uh, it, how do you identify germline SNVs used for the LOH reference? Do you use a matched normal sample? And if the normal cells are used as a control and a base reference for ploidy, how are those normal cells identified? Um, okay, thanks for the question. That's a good question. Um, so number one, we do not need a normal sample as a matched control. Um, typically, a your patient sample or your sample of interest that you're uh, um, that you want to analyze is sufficient. Um, the question around identifying germline as SNVs and differentiating them from potential uh, somatic or pathogenic variants um, is uh, addressed by um, our secondary analysis suit, um, Tapestry Insights. We use a number of information um, from various different databases that um, help you identify 
potential high quality non-synonymous mutations and uh, differentiate them from anything that might be disease driving. So um, um, cosmic ID and dbSNP ID, as well as more uh, quantitative metrics, um, including the number of cells that are mutated across your, uh, uh, across your sample will also aid you um, in identifying variants that are of germline character. Um, the second question was um, if normal cells are used as a control um, and, and as a, and a base reference for ploidy, it can be spiked in. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's our approach um, that we will um, support and recommend moving forward. Um, a small population of known cell line that is known to be diploid can always be included in your um, sample prep workflow that um, provides you with data downstream to